actually he was kidding we, could we all stand as we read God's word good morning my name is Candace and I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 14 and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over by their flock by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear and the angel said to them fear not for behold, I bring you good news and great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ our Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, and there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom with he is pleased. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible news of great joy announced by the angels to the shepherds, the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We praise you for your love that brought forth a precious gift to the world. Fill our hearts with peace and hope that comes with knowing Jesus. And may we share this good news with others, reflecting the light of your love in our lives. In your holy, precious name, amen. Well, I guess I don't need an introduction. Um, isn't that a beautiful stained glass window? I sat there looking at that and the cross. It's an instrument of execution. What does the world have in place of that? A hangman's noose? An electric chair? Or a firing squad? Nothing compares with that. The cross, an instrument of death, just like communion today. The experience that we had in this regard of the, the bread and the fruit of the vine. This is my body. This is my blood that's shed for you. That's truly the experience of a child of God to recognize that cross is empty. We belong on it if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus. He took your place and my place, died in our stead. The cross now today among believers particularly is an emblem of grace and mercy and blessing. And people wear it as jewelry because it's nothing that we are ashamed of. It's that which we precious is precious in our sight. And in a church like this, and have it there so visible all the time, it gives the Holy Spirit often opportunities that when the scripture is read and when the preaching is made, that the emphasis upon the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, that's always there present that the Holy Spirit can prick your heart and mind and soul to recognize it was, if it wasn't for you that wasn't the cross was not necessary it's because of us praise 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 well, if you're turning your Bibles with me this morning, the scripture that was read in the book of Luke, of Luke chapter 2, I focus upon one particular verse in this Christmas passage where Christ was announced first of all to the shepherds. But it's that last verse that I wanted to focus on, verse 14, that is read for us today. And I want to emphasize something about that today. I'm speaking upon, the, upon peace, uh, the uh, Advent candles and 
all of that. And uh, but uh, per Pastor gave me a choice of which of the four that I would rather preach on. I said, "Let me have the first one." And, and I, I said, "Peace." But peace isn't the first one. Is I guess it's hope. So anyway, you'll have to backtrack next week. Notice, if you will, verse fourteen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill toward men. Now that is misunderstood, and in fact is not even interpreted correctly or, or translated correctly. The title of my message is Peace. It's vertical, not horizontal. There are three aspects of peace. Well, there's various aspects, but the three that are focused in this regard is the, is the, is the, the fact that uh, peace in regards to the fact that what the shepherd, what the Lord, the angels said to the shepherds, when the first thing was peace on earth. Some interpret it as peace among, among men, as it is in my translation. But it's vertical. It's peace with God. Jesus Christ was born in a manger as a man, as a human being, with flesh in order that he may die. God is spirit, and spirit cannot die. And he took the initiative that he created us, and man failed in the sin of Adam. But in regards to the fact that when men have sinned, God made it, that uh, provision for us that if they won't do it, Adam failed. The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And he did spiritually, but not physically. He died some 300 years more, or 600 years. What, what, but it, was, it wasn't physical death, although that will ultimately result if, it, if he didn't. Think about the fact that if death, physical death, was not a consequence of Adam's sin, and every human being never died, never died, no person had ever died, there was no grave cemetery anywhere in the world, Think of the, I don't know, maybe trillions of people from the beginning in, in, Rome, in uh, Genesis chapter 3 to the present day. God knew what he was doing. That he would not allow the world to be overcome, overrun, and, and uh, subject to every degree of sin dominant. But it became so very bad that or the Lord God sent his son to die in our place and in our stead for, as it says here, for the glory of God, for the glory of the Father. And so I want to share, have you focus with me in sharing this matter, if you will, please, this morning. The glory of God in the highest. In other words, there's no greater degree than what is shed for us. Here, that the very thing that the birth of the Lord Jesus was the highest privilege that God gave to the experience of each of us. The glory of God is in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> John Peterson was a, a, a uh, well, he's written uh, music wise, but he was a theologian, he knew the scripture. And his, his cantatas, both for Christmas and Easter particularly, the one for, East, for Christmas that he wrote was called Born to Die. And that's exactly what Christmas is about. He came to die. You see, keeping him as a babe in a manger is no threat. But that is where the threat is. To receive the death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no hope for the world. The Christ came into the world to do what? Save, redeem sinners. <coughs> but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet Jesus Christ came to fulfill the glory of God. So he came as a baby, which made him acceptable and, and, and he's not a threat as a baby. 
but you put him as, as he is for the present time at the right hand of the Father, he's a, he, is, he comes back as the judge of every human being on the face of the earth, living and dead. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a problem with my throat. I need my water. Pardon me if I put this here. No, it's it's out of place. But anyway. So my thoughts are regard in this in, in Matthew chapter one and verse eleven, or verse twenty rather, it says, And they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's talking about the baby that came into this world. The first thirty years of his life was uneventful, in fact, unknown. His own brothers and sisters in the home of Joseph and Mary did not know, recognize him just as he was physically. He performed no miracles. He, won, he did not participate and, <coughs> and won the game no matter what it was because he was God in the flesh. He was natural and normal in every way. Christ brought glory to God and the angel said that he would here as, as our text says in verse 14. The angel. So in Mark 1, God declared him in, in Mark 1 11 as, and he was his the good pleasure of God. In his high priestly prayer in John 17 in verse 4 he says I have glorified thee on the earth and he has that's what makes Jesus Christ different than any other human being that's why he stands out in every generation and every nationality and every government every country in the world there's no one like him there's others who claim to be the Messiah but all have failed and he's the only one that has, has accomplished the, the work and the purpose of God. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it doesn't help me to train him, uh, keep my train of thought here, but if you'll bear with me, I'll appreciate it. Christ himself in John 14, 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. So in our text here in Luke 2, 14, peace between God and men, not peace among men, it's peace between God and men. Now man looks for peace this way, horizontally. That's the only thing they can, can attempt to accomplish but it will never work. It never has. It never will. And we'll see that in, in a moment. So as I said, peace is vertical. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Several passages I want you to look at. It's it's the power of the word of God rather than my speaking. Chapter 2 and begin at verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and both broken down in the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in the flesh the enmity, uh, enmity that even the, the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself of two, one new man to make peace 
and that he might reconcile both into God in one body by, this, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and, and came and preached peace to you who were far off and to them who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. That's that babe in the manger. But don't keep him there. Don't be satisfied at Christmas that we're all talking about. And that's this idea of gifts is, the, is that the, primarily for children. The children, that they look at Christmas, that's, oh, that's the time we're going, the Santa Claus is going to come and give us gifts. The reality of Christmas, it, the, the Savior came and gave us peace and joy and hope. And salvation, not material gifts. But that, that's how man overcomes the conscience of the scripture, denying here Christmas, it's Santa Claus, Easter, it's the Easter bunny, and Easter eggs colored, and all of this to take away anyone's thought about the reality of the, re the birth of Christ and the, and the resurrection of Christ. We don't have to deal with that, or they don't have to deal with that. But as the Lord Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and in that you find freedom. That's the thing about you and I as a believer. We have peace, as the world can never experience until they accept the fact of the birth and the resurrection res of Jesus Christ. He came for every human being, he died for every human being in that regard. Whosoever will that accepts him will be redeemed. Redemption is purchase. He bought us by that cross, by the, by the very shed blood that is brought to us. Another passage that I would have you turn to is in Colossians. Just a few pages back in this regard and in, in, in uh, Chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, and you that are once alienated and enemies in your, in your uh, minds and by wicked works yet now have been reconciled to the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unapprovable in his sight. If, I, if you continue in the, in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope uh, that the, go the, the, the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and, and which was preached to every creature that is under heaven, uh, by, of, him, of which I, Paul, am made a minister. See, the whole purpose is spiritual. Yes, God's interested in our material and physical life. But in reality of life and eternity, these are incidentals. They're just add-ons. My expression when people ask me how I am, I always or almost always say, I am better than I deserve. And some people want to argue about it. And I simply say, look, if I, if I was, if I, was uh, uh, if I had no arms and no legs, and I was totally dependent on some, everybody else to care for me. I'm still better off than I deserve. It's true of every one of us. Your life, your memory, your enjoyment, your pleasures of life, <clears throat> your mind. You know, God speaks to your mind and not to your heart. It's this thing up here, but it's not your brain. You have a mind. You know, God doesn't ever speak about the brain. Do you know that? 
but your, but your mind. And your mind is like God. You can't see it. You can't touch him or your mind. You can't touch it. There's nothing you do except the fact that you have a mind. And God speaks to your mind. But we come in the fact that we are also emotional beings. Many people want them to speak to their heart, their emotions. Many Christians live an emotional Christian life. If they can't experience it, it's not real to them. You see, but what God wants you to accept is what he says to you. That's why the word of God is so necessary for your life and mine as a Christian. It's here that he speaks to you. It's here that he recognizes you. It's here that he wants you to recognize him. This is the living word and Christ, or, I'm sorry, is the written word and Christ is the living word. But the living word is understood or not understood except in the written word. This is why your Bible is so necessary. Praise God in which the word of God has come to all scripture is given by the breath of God, the inspiration of God, and is profitable for everything. God wants you to recognize the experience of your life. What does the word of God have to say about that experience? It's there. Somewhere in the Bible, the word of God says things to us about the life that he gave us and the experiences in that life that we will have. The word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ was exemplified in living that word. He said, I come not to destroy the law, the Bible, the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment. And he's the only one that fulfilled everything in regards to that matter. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, The God of peace will be with you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Now the Lord of peace, the God of peace, now it's the Lord of peace, himself give you peace always, by all means, the Lord be with you all. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and, and pray, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be presented blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all the fact that the, he is the living word and we know him through the written word. In this passage in, in Luke, we have this matter. Of the, the Bible deals with God's peace uh, in, in several ways. And I only want to have you experience two of those. The, the horizontal one, a peace among men, is not what I want to consider today but the matter in regards to the peace with God, that is the necessary one. With God is make your peace with God. Oftentimes it's said to people that are facing death, make your peace with God. The idea of that is get right with God spiritually. It's to get saved, in other words, salvation. I want to deal with that one. And then I want to deal with the peace of God. That peace is only for you and I and every other one who knows Jesus Christ personally as their own personal Lord and Savior. <coughs> so the matter of, of peace with God, it's by which God provides salvation, peace with God. There's where we find peace is in salvation, only there. The other one, as I expressed, is the peace of God, and it's the peace that he provides by grace for daily living in the Christian life experience. The unsaved person cannot know the peace of God until he experiences peace with God. Therefore, the sinner is without peace. Listen to what Isaiah had to say back in Isaiah 57 and verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. 
whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The unsaved person. They may be, may be appear in, uh, in, uh, in their outside, uh, in their external life, of how they live among us and all of that, that they are very p peaceful. That may be true in that regard, of the, but in, internally, there is this turmoil, this turmoil, this struggle, this dissatisfaction. And think of it in real life. How about uh, all the fact that we're, we're, we're uh, people in the world are not content. But think about just practical things. Uh, we used to have a neighbor that lived across the street from us that every two or three years they got rid of their furniture and got new furniture. They were just tired of it. Some people do that same with automobiles, although it's not pretty good, much of a good idea today with the, the cost of them. A used car costs as much as a new one used to cost. Uh, but we're never satisfied in the world see, because there's no peace, no contentment, no satisfaction. And so they're always searching, searching, searching. But you stay close to the Lord and the word of God there's that peace that passes all understanding. Even in the dire circumstances of life, how does a believer handle death as well as an unbeliever? <clears throat> Some of my family, uh, aunts and uncles, uh, were unsaved. And, and, and uh, I remember when my... Uh, my, my, my grandmother died. She knew the Lord. She was a believer. She couldn't read or write, but she was pastor of the Baptist church there in a coal mining town of Milonga, West Virginia. I came and visited her every Saturday, read the scripture with her. And when she died, she was at her, one of her daughter's home in Denora, Pennsylvania. And she was out in the garden, as she always seemed to be, and she had a stroke and died. Her, her uh, son-in-law, uncle, uh, my uncle Leo Isaac, it's a, his house that she died. And the funeral, we had, we had two funerals. One there in Denora, Pennsylvania, an Episcopal kind of, of uh, experience, church and all. And the, and the casket was open. And my uncle Leo, or her son-in-law, uh, he, he cr almost crawled into the casket. He was so much uh, affected by her death, and he, he wailed and screamed and cried out to God, and it was, it, was, it was, as some people would have it, it was utterly embarrassing how he carried on. And the others were weeping all around. Do you know in the old days and in the old country, mourners were paid to come to a funeral? And they were paid to mourn and to weep and to wail and scream. You know, anyway, two days later, the, the, we took my grandmother back to Monongo, West Virginia. And, that, and that there, there was laughing. Uh, there was people just uh, roaming and all. And, and, the, and my, my Aunt Sadie, uh, because my mother and some others that were there were Christians and they they were they just praised God that she, they, she my grandmother went home that's all she just went home what's so sad about that her eternal home and my aunt Sadie just lit into my mother about you know you're at a funeral or you shouldn't be shouldn't be laughing and being smiling you should be wailing no you should not if you know Christ the difference between the two funeral two two funerals two days apart one of unsaved people, the others of believers with unsaved people there to witness it. There's a difference, isn't there, in the life of Christ. And when you live for him, you also die in him. And the joy comes because there's been made peace with God that results in peace, the peace of God that challenges and handles our understanding of that matter but the wicked have no peace in that regard. In Romans 3, 17, 
It says, the way of peace have they not known. And that's sad that they own the way. And when you go to funerals all the time, friends and loved ones who, who perhaps on, and some know Christ, some don't, you should see that you're, you're, the difference is always obvious to me. It should be to any believer to know that God made provision, first of all, in the coming of Jesus Christ as a babe in a manger, non-threatening, but accepting of a baby. But as he grew older, and as he began to reveal himself, and as he taught, and as he performed miracles, they became afraid of him. When he identified himself to be the son of God, that he was, that was, that he was God in the flesh, they, t they looked at it as blasphemous. Because Israel and the Jews in that day accepted the scripture of the Old Testament in, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 and verse 4. Here our God is one, one, not three. And so when Christ says he was the son of God, that makes, and he said in the Gospel of John that he was equal with the Father, claiming deity. They hated him. They, they tried to find different ways in which to get rid of him. And then, of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, and it was evident because there were witnesses and as the Easter story tells us, the fact that over, over 500 witnesses at one time saw him together at, at the one time. So there were many witnesses to the reality that he was alive. The disciples didn't even believe it in the beginning, even after he told them three times in the preaching of those, early, those later years that he was going to die. He must go to Jerusalem and die. But in three days, I will rise again. They didn't believe it. The two disciples with him on, or rather not, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. You know, they were, they were, it was just after he arose from the dead and they were leaving, they were leaving Jerusalem, going home. And, they, and then Jesus comes and appears with them and, and he was, uh, uh, they didn't recognize him. And he asked them, what, what, are you, what are you so sad about? And they said, well, we thought that Jesus was the Lord of glory, but, but he's dead and, and he's gone. And then he said, he, he opened the scriptures concerning himself, beginning with the book of Isaiah, where you find that great 53rd chapter there that, that, that is so evident of the of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in, 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 in the synagogues, uh, most everywhere in the world, they won't read Isaiah 53 in their own scripture. The rabbis refuse to let them read it because it's so evident that it's Jesus Christ that was prophesied of his death, burial, and resurrection. Where it says, and, and it pleased the Father to crush him. And then it spoke about his glory. Of the, of the resurrected Christ. God wants the world to know him and to know himself, and that's why Jesus came. Christ said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. I and my Father are one. That's the present presentation that you can have peace with God on the basis of simple faith, of believing what God says in both the Jewish scriptures and in the New Testament. The word of God in its totality is about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you can know him through God the Son. And when you do, you, are, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit where he enters into you, your body, your life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the fact do you, do, you, do you not know that, you, that your body is the temple of the Spirit of God who is in you and you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body as well as in your spirit. You see, as a Christian, we're to live the Christian life. Now, we don't have to, we don't have to do things differently to be recognized as a believer. 
like the Amish, you know, you know the Amish by their, by, or the Mennonite by their clothes. See, identity. I mentioned in Sunday school years ago, uh, I, had a, I had a lapel button that was given to me uh, that said, I'm a Coleman-ite, referring to the fact that I'm a follower of Catherine Coleman, the faith healer of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. See, we don't need that kind of identification about anything other than living a Christian life before a sinful world. The people that we, that we work for and work with, fa even family members, and the things that we do and not, do not do that they do. It make, it, we become evident because we're living the life of Christ because we have the peace with God in that matter of his, re, of his redemption that he gave. So why are there so many problems in the world? Everywhere you look, there are problems. We talk about peace today in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab nations and with Iran. And we talk about the fact that there's the desiring peace now between Russia and Ukraine, trying to find a new president of the United States is indicating that he'll, he'll solve that problem between those two, he, he, he thinks, and that why. And then we have the problem of China, See, who, become, who wants to replace the United States to be dominant in the world in every regard, particularly economically, as well as militarily. And you have countries with all kinds of revolutions that wants one to, uh, 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 accomplishes over another Rebel, uh, re rebels and, and uh, so peace comes when one dominates the other. That's the world's peace, but it's always uh, accomplished by the sword and the power of the gun. But it's forced peace. It's not the peace that the word of God speaks about. And that's only for those who recognize that they're, they need a savior, that they have no peace in their life. Marriages, family situations, all kinds of things in which, which we find the, the problems of this world. It's <clears throat> the, the reason unsaved hearts will never find peace apart from the Lord Jesus. That's why it's incumbent upon every fundamental Bible-believing church to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Clearly divine, de defined for us just like Communion was so divine, de, de, described for us in the scripture of 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses describes the gospel, why we are to preach the gospel, and why Christ came into the world in that, in that regard. In John 14, this is a good passage. I, I have to look away. John 14, and one verse I want to focus on, uh, John, chapter 14, verse 27. Again, this is this wonderful aspect. Yeah. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16 is what's called, what's called is the upper room discourse. This is where he took his disciples aside and he, he taught them about himself and the Holy Spirit and how things are going to change when they recognize and, and practice the reality of, of what the purpose of, of God does in this regard. Peace I have, peace I leave with you, Christ says. My peace I give to you, not as the world give, uh, do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a wonderful verse to encourage and certainly to challenge. Peace, I notice, appears twice in that one verse in that regard. But we have turmoil that's in many of us. And, and they're, they're even uh, whether we had the turmoil, the turmoil is near us in terms of loved ones having difficulties in which they struggle. It's around us and beyond us, and it dominates so much in this fallen world that we live in. The Bible speaks to you and me as a believer that we are strangers and pilgrims in the world. In other words, we don't belong here. 
That's why the day will come when God says, you've had enough. I'm going to take you home and, be my, and I will be peace to you, with you, for you. The glory of God. Peace appears wonderfully for us. So this is uh, an absence of peace in our personal lives, in our family lives, and peace so our locality, areas of uh, different aspects. Nationally, we struggle with peace. We came off a very uh, 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 election that was, was fraught with, with uh, 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 hatred and, and lies and all of that. And, and now I saw last night on one of the stations that, that the people who cannot accept the fact that, we have, that uh, Donald Trump has won the election, it showed them some, on some uh, bank of some river or some lake, all these people that were, they'd said, uh, you, here's how you deal with, you, with the fact that he, he got elected. You just scream to the top of your lungs. And all these people are out there screaming because they refuse to accept the, the result of, of election. Those things don't make for peace. See? We can accept anything that God th throws at us because it's, he has a purpose in it. See? And we want to simply be instruments for the glory of God. How do we deal with the, the circumstance and the problems that we find ourselves in? It's not just us. I mentioned the fact this morning as well the fact that oftentimes as a pastor, when I visit a person in a hospital, one of the first questions I ask, well, do you know why you're here? The reality is you're here for the glory of God. Everything we do should be for the glory of God. But we're not mindful of that. We're not conscious of that because it's not in our, uh, in our total thinking of, of living. We, it's the circumstances that is more prominent than the Lord Jesus and our relationship to him is in any circumstance of life. Even how we deal with our economic situation as well as our physical, mental, and all of that. Where is the Lord Jesus that gives peace in every circumstance? We should never have be that kind of aspect or turmoil. You know, there's in about... Uh, there's about 3,500 or 30, 3,500 years of recorded history. And some historians and archaeologists, I guess, and others have tried to determine in all those 3,500 years, how many years was there considered to be years of peace and not turmoil? And they came up with the fact that about 300 of the 3,500 years, 300 years could be considered peaceful years in the world. What? A, that's our, but that's the common aspect of what sin does. Sin destroys. See? And yet, people love their sin. They don't want to give it up for any, re, any regard or any circumstance. So how many peaceful treaties then have been signed through the years that have been broken in, throughout history? All of them, at one time or another. Israel's trying now to find some kind of, a, not peace, but an accommodation with, with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. The fact that Israel has signed peace treaties in the past with various Arab countries and every time the Arab country broke it, the peace. And Israel, for its entire modern history, since 1948, had gone through six different wars with their neighbors and won every war. And every time they want peace, Israel will sign treaties for any nation that, wants, that, he, that he, they're willing to give Israel peace. But Israel would never have peace and because God is disciplining the nation of Israel for all her 3,000 or more years of failure and sin and rejection of Jesus Christ. And so they will continue to suffer until the prince 
of peace comes to bring peace on the earth. Then it will be peace among men see, from, uh, and, and in every regard. John 14, 27, the biblical definition of peace. God's word, <clears throat> only God's word and only God through his word can point and experience real peace. Here's something that I used through the years in terms of other uh, uh, subjects that I've dealt with in the, in the past. <clears throat> but if I apply it today to the subject of, of peace, vertically between God and the believer, it's never vertical between God and the unbeliever. It's only horizontal among men, but not with God. It's among men themselves. That's why Israel will never truly find peace. So let me say it this way. If all that I need, all that I need is God, period, I have peace. All that I need is God, and whatever he chooses to provide, I have peace. All that I need is God, and whatever he chooses to provide, and I don't need it. I am at peace. All that I need is God. I am at peace. Is that enough for you? It needs to be, ought to be. In that you find contentment. In that you find enjoyment. In that you find the will of God in your personal life. In that you find that experience. We all love experience. But it's not the experience, it's the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall know the truth, see. In that is freedom. The word of God is truth, see, in that regard. Let me, uh, well, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, under the Israel, the Jews, is the word shalom. You recognize it. We hear it a lot today, even, uh, even among us, the, the peace, shalom. It, peace. But it's, it, the idea is, by the Jews it's, that say that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a desire. It is when they say peace, shalom. It's a desire on our part that you will, you will, exceed, you will receive all that's good that can be accomplished in, for you in your life. It's, a, it's truly an idea of being peaceful or having peace in that regard. Uh, how many, I'm sure you do, I don't even have to ask. Our hymn book has several hymns written by a lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby. When when she was six weeks old, she had an eye, in, eye infection, and the doctor put uh, com compress com compresses on their eyes that was extremely hot. Now, six weeks old baby we're talking about here. And as a result of the compress compresses, it, it, it destroyed her eyes, her eyesight. Six weeks old. At, three mo at six months, her father died. Her mother and her maternal grandmother raised her to adulthood and she received Christ as a young girl, 11 or 12, somewhere along there. But when she was eight years old, this is what she penned, eight, an eight-year-old child in regards to her blindness. Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, uh, content I will be. How many blessings I enjoy there, the, uh, that, uh, that other people's, uh, people don't. To weep and to sigh because I'm blind? I cannot. I won't. Eight years old. She wrote more than 8,000, I say between eight and 9,000 hymns 
and poems in her life. She died at the age of 95. She married in age 41, I believe it was, to another blind person, a man. And, uh, and, uh, and she survived him. She had a child, and the child also died as a, as a child, but not as an infant. But let me just, uh, now think about, I'm not going to read all 8,000. <laughs> but these are ones, and you tell me if this, this child, this girl, this lady, Fanny Crosby, if she was a woman of peace of God. Praise him, praise him. To God be the glory, great things he had done. Nearer the cross, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Give me Jesus, my Savior first of all. Saved by grace, Jesus is calling, tenderly calling, close to thee. Draw me nearer, Lord, draw me nearer. Rescue the perishing, saved by grace. To God be the glory, wonderful Savior is Jesus. Draw me nearer, sure, uh, uh, saved in the arms of Jesus. Blessed assurance, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask besides? Be still, my soul. There's a lady that understood what it was to have the peace of God. Do we have that kind of attitude? Because we have the same Savior. We have the same content of our Christian life that's given for us. Do you know, uh, as I said, she was raised by her mother and her, her maternal grandmother. They taught her, and she, she memorized, she memorized as a blind person, the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, the book of Luke, the book of John, and several of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Apparently, she had a photostatic mind, I would think, for that. But, she, she, you know, she lived to be 95, writing over 8,000. There is the peace of God. See? Can you find that in your life and mine for the glory of God? I want to share this in something that um, John MacArthur wrote in one of his uh, one of his sermons. If I uh, here it is, it's about peace. What he wrote about it. He says this: <clears throat> Peace is the very essence of God's nature. One of, it's one of his attributes. God is at all times at perfect peace without discord within his heart. He is never under stress, worry, or anxious, fearful, unsure, or threatened. He is always perfectly calm, tranquil, content. There is no surprise for his omniscience. No change for his immutability, no threat to his sovereignty, no doubts to cloud his vision, no sin to stand or stain, to stain his holiness. Even his wrath is clear, controlled, calm, and confident. That's peace of life in every situation that he, he describes and found it. So, Now, how do we have the finest peace? We find it by faith, faith in his word. That's what brings it into our life experience. Faith is to take for ourselves what God has, has, has already done at Calvary and through the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith begins there. Faith will lead us home, trusting the Lord, confident, and therefore, having peace. 
The result of this faith is justification. It's not something that we do. It's something that God did for us and also to us. We are justified freely by his grace. Justification is being declared righteous. When we have been saved, this is what God has done for us. He takes my sin of my whole life, all of my sin, past, present, future, takes it all. Here I am living in, I was saved when I was nine years old, and that was around uh, 1947. 1947. Since then, I'm 86 years old. However long I'm going to live till I die or till the, when the Lord Jesus comes. All my sin, Christ took upon himself when he went to cross. He said he took all my sin, your sin, with him. He died in my place, my substitute, your substitute. We ought to be on that cross. The reason it's empty is because Christ accomplished what he intended to accomplish, salvation and the declaration of justification, being declared by God that he took my sin and placed it on. This is why Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The second person of the Godhead, my, your son, why have you forsaken me? Because he saw John Moosey and every one of us on the cross. He died as my substitute. But God saw you and me there. So it's a matter of imputation, what's a theological word of imputation, imputed. It, it's a, a common word, but it's not the best one. But it, the common word is transfer. God transferred all my sin to Jesus Christ. When, that's, he imputed my sin to Christ. But at the same time, he took the righteousness of Christ and imputed it to me. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10, it speaks there of the fact that we come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, as, a, as an individual and as a sinner, you come into the presence of God boldly when you acknowledge and recognize your sinfulness, why do we come boldly? Why can we come boldly to enter the presence of God? Because God the Father sees the God the Son in each and every one of us. That's imputation. See, justification leads to imputation. Great theological words that have a tremendous experience in those, in those very words. And have you found peace? That kind of peace? As Fanny Crosby said, take the world, but give me Jesus. Let me close with uh, a passage of scripture that I would share with you. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Just think of that. Passes all understanding. It can't be explained. It's experienced. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Read the, the book of Philippians, particularly chapter 4 when he speaks, he says this matter. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you, you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And in John 16, 13, or 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. May God bless you. May he, may he find pleasure in each of your minds and hearts today as we worship together.
I want to thank you so much for listening and watching in here today. If you happen to be in the Canton area and you'd like to attend one of our services live, I can't wait to meet you. I'd love to see you and visit with you in person. But until we meet, remember a few things. One, make sure that you're spending plenty of time in the Word of God. Let that Word of God fill your heart with goodness and richness and let it fuel your prayer life as you pray for yourselves, your families, your church, and all those that are around you. And also, don't forget, don't forget today is as good a day as ever to share the reason for the hope that is in you with someone else. I'm Sean Matego thanking you again for listening in at Whipple Avenue Baptist Church. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless and so long.